All right, well, welcome everyone to the Towards an Advocacy Coalition panel. We have a fantastic panel here today. I'll just do some quick introductions of myself and the panelists, and then the way we're gonna structure it today, they're gonna give us each about a five minute presentation of what they learned over the course of their time working on Puerto Rico, um, and where do we go from here, right? And so it'll be about 20 minutes, but I wanna leave as much time for the audience participation as possible at the end. Um, so hopefully we can get them to go through and then we'll take it from the floor. Um, but real quickly, my name is Jason Ortiz. I am the president of the Connecticut Puerto Rican Agenda, which is a chapter of the National Puerto Rican Agenda. And I live in Hartford, Connecticut. And I work for Councilwoman Wilda Lise Bermudez, who is a city councilwoman in Hartford, Connecticut. Um, and we've been working directly with a number of the families that have come to Hartford and figuring out how on a statewide level in Connecticut, uh, we can secure more resources for families that are coming uh, while also supporting all of the folks that are doing work um, both here in the States and back in uh, Puerto Rico. Um, and so a little bit of background on myself as far as my family. My family is from Mayo, I mean from Añasco, Puerto Rico, uh, and Caguas. And so I have kind of family all over the place, and I've spent uh, some time in Puerto Rico. I've actually lived there a couple times myself, once in San Jose uh, and once in Rio Piedras. And so I have been back and forth a little bit. Um, it was actually after I left Rio Piedras that I came back to the States specifically to organize the diaspora. And it has been a very interesting experience that I'm more than happy to talk to folks about afterwards as far as how to actually start a chapter-based organization. But today, uh, we're talking about coalitions, right? And coalitions are when we try to align multiple groups together towards a common cause, right? And so that is how we make these massive organizations that have been around for a while united in bringing justice for Puerto Rico, right? And so this has its own challenges and benefits there. Um, but I'll go down the list here of our, our, our panelists. Um, we have Greg Batista. Uh, who is the president of G. Batista and Batista and Associates. Uh, one of Mr. Batista's passions is helping his homeland in Puerto Rico. He has held several board and prominent positions on PROPESA, the Puerto Rican Professional Association, and the Puerto Rican Leadership Council of South Florida. Greg has also been on the board of Colegio de Ingenieros y Agrimensores de Puerto Rico, <laughs> where he received the 2016 award uh, as Borijario Distinguished Distinguido. Uh, sure, yeah, exactly. Uh, he is currently the co-founder and board member of the Puerto Rican Professionals of Florida and also the president of the Puerto Rican Alliance of Florida, which hosts its symposium in South Florida. So please give a hand for Greg Batista. Uh, next, we have Maria Roma, who is a founder and board member of the National Puerto Rican Agenda. Uh, in 2010, she retired as a civil service and government employee with the state of New York, where she had the privilege and honor of working under the leadership of five New York state governors. One of her memorable moments in state service was to serve as senior policy staff member for Governor Georgie e. Pachaki. As the principal liaison to the Hispanic community, she was involved in the statewide planning and policy development affecting health, safety, and welfare of New Yorkers throughout the state. So thank you for being here, Maria. <laughs> Next up, we have Jaime Ferrant. He's the managing director of relief efforts at Flamboyant Foundation. Uh, Jaime is a passionate advocate that has successfully worked and led multidisciplinary legal efforts around the world. Uh, Jaime presently works as managing director for relief efforts at the Flamboyant Foundation, where he is responsible for coordinating and managing the foundation's efforts to support relief work in Puerto Rico. He is also a practicing attorney and owner of Arant uh, LLC, a law firm where he provides immigration legal advice, assistance, and representation in a wide variety of matters. So thank you, Jaime. <laughs> And lastly, we have Will Gonzalez, who is the executive director of SEBA. Will has over 35 years of experience working in the Latino community. Mr. Gonzalez is licensed to practice law in New Jersey and Pennsylvania. He is the past president of the Hispanic Bar Association of Pennsylvania and a member of the board of the PA chapter of the ACLU. He has a Bachelor of Arts in Economics from Lehigh University, uh, a Juris Doctor from Rutgers University School of Law, where he was awarded the Ralph Lunch Fellowship and the Law Student Civil Rights Research uh, Council Fellowship, the Philadelphia Foundation's Williams Award for Organizational Excellence, and the Community Change Award from the Bread and Roses Community Fund recognizes leadership in the realm of nonprofit management. So, thank you. And so, uh, we're going to start with Greg. And again, we're you know, trying to figure out how we can get towards a national advocacy coalition. So, there's going to be lots of different ways that we can try to do that, different pieces of the pie that we need to focus on over the next you know, few years here. Um, and so we hope to have a diversity of opinions on how do we get there from here. And so, Greg, why don't you start off? Hi, everybody. My name, like you said, my name is Greg Batista. Um, I'm probably the least qualified here to talk about this because I'm, I'm an engineer and I'm a contractor and I have my own engineering business and contracting business back in, in South Florida. Um, 
But I can speak to this because just recently, my daughter and I founded a organization called Puerto Rican Alliance of Florida. There's one thing that, that the Dr. Melendez said that really, that que me chocó. It was that he said, yes, he said this morning that there's three things that need to happen if you're going to get something going. It's the three A's that Isabel Pantoa talked about, which was awareness, it was uh, analysis, and action. And I thought about it. Everybody's aware. If you have a problem, you're automatically aware. That's the least work that, that needs that the least work that needs to happen. Analysis is a lot of work. Because obviously, if you if you have a problem, you have to analyze it. And analysis as an engineer, analysis comes with numbers. And when I was looking into Hunter College and looking at what, what they stood for, I was blown away by the amount of data that was available. We don't have that back in, in Florida. Um, I just picked up a bunch of folletos that were over there. It says, hey, the, the, the Puerto Ricans in Ohio, the Puerto Ricans in, in Connecticut. I didn't see one for Florida. Florida has such a massive amount of, of Puerto Ricans if, on the influx coming in. I said, why don't we have that kind of thing over there in Florida? We have been able, through our organization, to partner with FIU, Florida International University, which is the second largest university in, in Florida. We've been able to partner with them, with their community, with, in, in talks with their president, in order to establish something similar to what is going on. Should I step back with the camera? Oh, it's, it's off. No, it's fine. <laughs> it's fine. It's like, oh my God. Yeah, it's it's off. Off. Yeah, it's keep going. So, <clears throat> What we were trying to establish is something hunter-like and trying to, trying to get into the data. We think and we really believe, and this is the gist of what I'm talking about here, we really believe that data permeates everything. Permeates everything. Data is, is the basis of that analysis that you're trying to get to before you go into the third A, which is action, okay? So data for us as an engineer, I really believe that data permeates everything. And in trying to attain that, we're, we hope that in our presence here with, with Hunter College, we're able to do that. Um, now, in being able to establish a coalition, which is the theme of this, of this particular, uh, this particular uh, meeting here, we, we really think that as a starting point, that if we're able to establish some sort of synergy with, with this institution, establish synergy with other organizations and be able to get in with some, uh, some good data, that we're able to take the next step to us, Basically, data is the foundation where everything else uh, flows into. That's basically my point. Well, I don't know if I should stand or should I sit or I do it in Spanish or I do it in English. Anyway, we'll do it both ways. Maria Roman, eh, Dumain is my mother's maiden last name. I carry both my father and my mother's last name. Sipuku Costumbre Puerto Riqueña. In 1959, uh, I came from Arecibo, Puerto Rico. Familia vino de Arecibo. We came to the uh, mainland, uh, settled in the Bronx. And um, most of my elementary years in public high school, it was Maria Roman. 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 That's the only way I learned. Maria Roman was not what I first learned. Um, and my mother was told, no le hable español, porque la está confundiendo. So at that time, my there was no bilingual programs, programs back then, you know, in the 50s. Para no decir nada. So we went back to Puerto Rico. And uh, it was very interesting because I was able to learn, understand, and respect mi cultura. Uh, in the 70s, we, I graduated from high school in Puerto Rico, Doctora Maria Cartilla de Martinez in Arecibo. I attended the University of Puerto Rico, and then I come back to New York in the 70s, very hard times in the Bronx. The Bronx was burning, uh, and we found mentors, Puerto Ricans living in the South Bronx, that were into building coalitions. And I was very fortunate that I was able to meet the Dr. Ramon Ezebeles, the Herman Padillos, the General Valentin, all these wonderful people that were into building coalitions. 
And even though they all had their different uh, agendas, but it was all about promoting the Puerto Rican culture, the traditions, promoting and preserving. So I was very fortunate that I was able to line up, align myself with a lot of Puerto Ricans that were already opening the path to those pioneers that were here. So I volunteered to be on the New York Puerto Rican Parade Committee back in, in the 70s. And that built up more coalitions, but then I started with the advancement of Puerto Rican culture. And then I got involved with El Voto, eh, La Cruzada del Voto, because we needed to register more Puerto Ricans. And then I was in government for forever, like se I joined in 74. So we had, uh, under the leadership of Governor Mario Cuomo, I worked for him for 12 years, and I was very blessed because we had a lot of Puerto Ricans in the organization, in the government, in fact, Rose Rodriguez sitting back there, hi Rose, she was another person of decision making that, you know, is not only having employees in government, but Governor Mario Cuomo gave her the responsibility of addressing the Puerto Rican Hispanic community. So all of us that were in Hispanic and state government, we strategically had Puerto Ricans in different agencies. So continuing talking about coalitions, you see how you go from cultural to government to civic, then you have the churches. For those churches that didn't have Spanish language masses, El Puerto Ricano would go out of their way to make sure that you had Spanish language masses. So you built up a lot of coalitions throughout the years. And then all of a sudden, Fast forward, 40 years later, after I worked for five governors, I am now retired, but I won't stay home. I am still involved in building coalitions and advocating for different Puerto Rican organizations. And my last role right now is that I'm a member of the National Puerto Rican Agenda, which just was, is, a, is still a, an organization in, in, in Pampers. Like I call it, just, it was just born uh, last year and our mission is basically, you know, to educate, unite, and create solutions for the Puerto Ricans in the mainland and in Puerto Rico. So you basically have an idea that my life, I've been very fortunate that I have been exposed to that advocacy and coalition because I've been at the right time, at the right place, with the right people. Thank you. <laughs> Bueno, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Jaime. I'm from Guaynabo, en Arecibo, porque mi mamá me está viendo. So I have to acknowledge mis raíces de Arecibeña del barrio Barranca. Yeah. Like, like all of us, Maria changed our perspective of Puerto Rico. I mean, it, it transformed Puerto Rico and it transformed us. Uh, after, Ma after Maria, we've seen, you know, if I live in, in the Washington DC area and Puerto Ricans, the Puerto Rican community in the DC area is large, but mostly invisible. We don't have anyone saying, ah, my dad, my parents are from Virginia and I grew up in Virginia, like it's very rare. I'm from DC, I'm, but I'm Puerto Rican, like here in, in New York, and I'm from El Barrio, I'm from the Bronx, I'm from Harlem. You don't hear that in, in DC. Just in the state of Virginia, there's 95,000 Puerto Ricans living in the state of Virginia. There are zero Puerto Rican restaurants and zero panaderias in the state of Virginia. There's, a, there's zero, there's only one food truck, the Boricua food truck. They're working it on. Uh, so that's the Puerto Rican community in the DC area. So we're trying to build a community that's large, but not particularly active, although they've been active in, 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 in Maria. So I want to share some examples because Maria, I think, fundamentally changed what the Puerto Rican government is and what the Puerto Rican diaspora is. <coughs> the estimates in the, in the fiscal plan that was approved by the Oversight Board say that by 2023, they estimate that there's going to be 2.9 million Puerto Ricans in the island and 6 million Puerto Ricans 
living in, in the United States. So the Puerto Rican government, as I see it, needs to transform itself into one that serves the needs of the Puerto Rican community, the Puerto Ricans that live in the island, and the Puerto Ricans that have been displaced or that have moved. You know, I came to the I came to the United States in 2001, but as you we know, hundreds of thousands of people have moved since September of last year and, and are going to keep moving if the estimates are are correct. So we need to make sure that the, that we are an, an active part because many of us did not move or many of us would like to go back but now feel, well, if I don't have an opportunity, I don't want to go back. So we need to create and the Puerto Rican government needs to see that we are all together in this. As, as Edwin said this morning, we're, we're, we're 9 million people. So the government is 9 million people. And so I want to share a couple of examples because I've been, I work, I work uh, doing a lot of immigration work and I particularly work with the, with the Mexican community quite a bit. And, and Mexico presents an interesting model for us to look at and see how we can potentially, what can we become as a, as a, as a Puerto Rican community. In Mexico, uh, former president Vicente Fox created a, a, an agency called the Instituto de Mexicanos en el Exterior. And, uh, and it's, a, it's, a, it's an agency that is for serving Mexicans who live outside of the country. There are close to 12 million Mexicans living in the United States. It's 97% of the total of Mexicans that live outside of, of Mexico. So most of them live here in, in the US. Uh, as part of that in instituto, the Mexican government created a, a program that is called El Consejo Consultivo del Instituto, the Advisory Council of the Institute. This advisory council, it's a very large council, and, it's a, it, you know, and I can go into the weeds if you have questions, because I've, I've read the statute, but it has members of Mexican organizations and members of the Mexican community that provide input and advice to the Mexican government on issues that affect the Mexican migrant community. Why do I bring this? Because Puerto Rico now will have two times its population not in Puerto Rico. So our voices will have to be heard. The government will have to acknowledge our existence. For example, maybe this is me being overly sensitive, but we saw Governor Rosselló go to Florida last month or two months ago to launch his initiative uh, for that, to get Puerto Ricans to register to vote in, in US elections. That's a great idea. I'm all for civic engagement. I've helped register people to vote in my life. But it's like, oh, off you go, go vote. Like that's what it felt like to me. <laughs> we want to do more than just vote. If we see all the aid that has been raised and all that has been given, voting there is not enough. Puerto Rico will now, especially in its fiscal crisis, I believe Puerto Rico is going to be depending more than ever on remittances from the Puerto Rican community in the diaspora, which has never been a big uh, uh, percentage of the economy, especially compared to Central American company, countries, for example. But I think that will increase over the, over, over the next few years as the people remaining behind are are elderly and some of us will have to take care of our parents and of our relatives from here. So that was how this Consejo got created. It was to help Mexicans in particular with the topic of remittances. And so they've organized and they developed the honorary positions in the Mexican Congress, in the Senate and the, and the Camara de Diputados. And one of the things that are, they achieved two things that I want to mention that are things that we can look at as an organized Puerto Rican community. Number one, Mexico passed a law that this year will be the first time that Mexicans living outside of Mexico will vote in presidential elections in Mexico. And they've created a, a very interesting process where, where Mexicans can, living here can register and vote, no matter if they're US citizens. They, they, they will be able to, to vote in the elections in this country. I, here in Puerto Rico, for example, you know, the, the, the elections at this goes, when you're organizing, we don't bring rojos, azules, y verdes in the Puerto Rican debate, but I think we all want to be involved politically, no matter our color. Especially in the question of our political status, we all have a, a say, no matter where we are, and I think that the, any election result in Puerto Rico's future will be more legitimate if we are included in this, in this debate. So I will just say that as one example, and this law, it will be the first time that Mexico ever does it. The second program, Another program that the Mexican community has done is a program, it's a very interesting program called Tres por Uno, which is a program where it's, it's uh, for certain projects, social projects, infrastructure projects, 
and uh, community development and education. And so if I get a group here in the United States, I can raise money, say, to build a, a school in a town in Mexico, and the Mexican government will match those funds. Mexican government, in conjunction with the Mexican diaspora and, and the Mexican st uh, state, they raised money together for, for a particular project. And so now as I'm hearing today, like, you know, as Ellen was saying, other people were saying, we've raised $70 million as a Puerto Rican community, but we need $100 billion. And now we have, Puerto Rico will have all this money coming from the federal government that we want to make sure it's used responsibly. And so, for example, one good way we could use it is how we can match funds creatively for the benefit of our communities in, in Puerto Rico. And this could be one way, for example, of, of doing it. I'm saying it's the only way, and we can certainly come up with much better ways to do it. But I just want to put the idea that we as Puerto Ricans, as we organize here now, we need to have a voice in both Puerto Rico's affairs and the affairs here in the, in the US to make sure we're not forgetting it, forgotten the national debate and that we build uh, initiatives that allow us to have our, our voice and we can play an active role in, in the island. Thank you. Buenas tardes. Uh, my name is Will Gonzalez. I'm sorry for being my back. Uh, I'm the executive director of a organ of organizations in Philadelphia called SEBA. Uh, it's not an acronym, it's a concept of the SEBA tree before the tradition and people will chill out. And, the tree <laughs> and, out. and also, as you know, they last, we have some for you that are over 500 years old, so they, they last a long time. Um, they asked us to answer three questions What do we know? What are we doing right now? And where do we go from, right? So I'm going to use Pennsylvania as to an example of what we know, right? You know, that's what I know most about regarding Pennsylvania. So uh, what we know is that the population of Puerto Ricans uh, was increasing before Maria, and now it's growing exponentially. Uh, we know, thanks to a centro, that uh, Pennsylvania is the uh, second most popular destination of choice for Puerto Ricans leaving the island before Maria, and that we expect close to 56,000 more Puerto Ricans. So that was an early analysis, probably increased. Uh, before the end of this year. Uh, we've seen close to 6,000 folks coming into Pennsylvania so far. Uh, the schools are overwhelmed. Uh, Philadelphia has the second largest number of Puerto Ricans uh, in terms of the size of the city, uh, second to New York. Um, but uh, interestingly enough, what we've seen a lot of Puerto Ricans coming to the, to the I call it the 222 corridor because it's a highway uh, in the southeastern part of Pennsylvania that has the cities of Allentown, Bethlehem, Reading, Lancaster, Harrisburg, Lebanon. Uh, and that's grown probably more than Philadelphia in terms of Puerto Ricans coming from the island there, and, and especially after Maria. And that has huge implications politically. I'm sorry. That has huge implications <laughs> politically uh, because, as you know, Pennsylvania is a very important state. I'm sorry, I don't want to get back, back to you. Pennsylvania is a very important state, and we've had challenges uh, in trying to get uh, some of those jurisdictions to follow basic laws related to voting rights, like Section 2 or 3 of the Voting Rights that says that uh, if you have a certain number of people in your population, you're supposed to have materials in Spanish, right? For us, we're a Spanish speakers, the largest limited English proficient population in the country and in Pennsylvania. But now they're going to find it harder to ignore us politically, even though we need a lot to do to be engaged politically. Um, we have the numbers, we don't have the participation. So that's what we know. We also know that um, we've been really working hard. We were working hard before Maria, but with the increase in evacuees, all of us have been carrying an extra load. Uh, and that's been very challenging. Uh, and what's kept us going is, uh, I think Nilda said it, it's personal. And that's why when you get tired, you know it's personal, you just keep going and going and going. And so we've been working very hard. So it's been kind of uh, difficult, right? What are we doing right now? Trying to meet the needs of evacuees, trying to get the government to pay attention to that increase. Again, most of my comments are focusing on the evacuees here and what um, the challenges are for engagement of organizations and people here, right? Because we have the power to vote. And if we have the power to vote in and think of the interests of Puerto Rico, we can do a lot for Puerto Rico, right? Um, so we're doing a lot, but not enough. I think Denise said that earlier today. And it's not that we 
uh, for lack of trying. It's just that there's only 24 hours in a day, seven days in a week. And believe me, I know that if you gave me two more hours, I would spend it. Or two more days, I would spend it on what we're doing right now. But there's a time limit, right? So what's next? What's next is we need to get the resources to get the mortar. We have bricks. Again, UC Pennsylvania uh, and Philadelphia as an example, we have great nonprofit institutions. Uh, we're doing an analysis now, 15 nonprofits in, in Philadelphia have half a billion dollar impact on the economy of Philadelphia. So we, we have very strong institutions, but they're focused on their programs and, and, and in dealing in, which is addressing the poorest community in Philadelphia, is the Latino community concentrated in East and North Philadelphia. So we have that challenge. And to do advocacy on the scale that we need, again, focusing on Pennsylvania, we're going to need the support. We're going to need support. What type of support? Staff. And I'm not saying that you give us the money for that. What I'm saying is that we need the coordinators to organize the grass tops, the community-based organizations, and the organizers to, at the grassroots level, get people involved. And how, what's that structure? It could be one national organization with various uh, satellite groups. Nothing new. Some of these campaigns are done uh, on various efforts. Or it could be a patchwork of uh, organizations brought together. But the bottom line is we need to secure the resources to get the people power to work, to coordinate, and to organize. Because if we leave it to just uh, those of us who are already haciendo muchas cosas con lo poco que tenemos, it's not going to happen. These gatherings are amazing. They're great. They're wonderful. But we now need to go, what are we going to do after we leave tomorrow? Mm -hmm. And that's the action. And we all want to act, but we need the muscle power to help us coordinate. So we need to go to the foundation some way, somehow, and, and, and other philanthropy uh, opportunities and bring the resources in to make that happen through either a quilt of different coalitions or one national organization. The other thing is we can't forget about our community. If we just collect one dollar, just one dollar from every Puerto Rican here, that's enough to run something good. So thinking about that, now there's a, there's a challenge because also we're trying to raise money for Puerto Rico, we're trying to raise money for the organizations here that are doing social work, but one dollar, you know. Um, again, we need the coordinators, the organizers, and from that, the training that comes with it. Um, last but not least, you know, it's not going to be done overnight, uh, but at the same time, we got to hurry up. I am concerned that some of that space is being taken over by partisan efforts, and that's not cool. I think one of the, ma the magical things that we have in, the, in these gatherings is the nonpartisanness and the focus on one or two, th two, three things that we can all agree. Because if we start talking about things that we don't agree, in three minutes, this room will be empty. Or And so I think it's important that there be focus on the issues and focus on getting the resources. And then we can really leverage that into political power that will help Puerto Rico and will help the people here. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for the panel for explaining you know, kind of where we're at right now. We definitely need uh, to take advantage of the organizations like the parades and folks that are doing voter outreach, you know, that are in every state in the country. We definitely need more data in order to prove to some of our funders, right, that we do need the help in, in staffing context, right? Because it is clear that there are lots of folks doing lots of things, but we are not uniting together, especially when it comes to lobbying in places like DC, right? And that's where our 5 million is one voting block to that, or that, that particular demographic, right? As we split up in various states, we can do things on the state level, um, but we know that this is a national problem that's affecting every single state in the country, and that means we need to have a national coalition, a national organization in order to respond. Um, and so with that, I would like to open it up to the floor. I mean, folks, you just raise their hand if they do have a question. Yeah, yeah go for it. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, the issue of the dichotomy between the homeland population and the population in the United States is something that has come up time and time again. And, uh, for example, in, in Ireland, there are currently uh, 6 million Irish people living. In the United States, there are 40 million people of Irish ancestry. Uh, the only time the Irish in the United States have, 
have been involved in the politics of Ireland was to secure their independence and national sovereignty. And, and the Irish in Ireland welcomed that. In Puerto Rico, uh, the situation has been different. When uh, Congressman Serrano tried to organize a, an effort to get Puerto Ricans to vote in Puerto Rican elections, the Puerto Rican government opposed it. And they made sure that such an effort was killed so that there is no reference recently. There's been no reference to the absentee ballot on the part of Puerto Ricans in Puerto Rico for those living in the United States. So how do you explain the, you know, the Irish example where you had the Irish accepting uh, the Irish immigrant participation in their, in their efforts, whereas you have Puerto Rican government in Puerto Rico, the political parties rejecting uh, the diaspora participation in their elections. That's a That's a great question. Uh, I think uh, sadly many, many countries and leaders around the world uh, want to do efforts to make sure less people vote. I'm a fan of getting more people to vote, so, so the government might have its reasons for, for not wanting people to vote. I think, uh, me personally, I think that has changed since, since Maria. I think one of the positive things that Maria has changed is, is that. Uh, I mean, the, the way, like, for example, I left, I left like, as I said, 15 years ago, and, and people would tell me, like, ah, tú no sabes que como está Puerto Rico porque tú te fuiste. And, like, I would get all the time, like, oh, you left. You, you know, you left, you don't know. And, uh, and like last December, when I went back to Puerto Rico, a lot of that same people would communicate or even afterwards, like, uh, thank you for what you all are, are doing now. And, and like, it's a very different, I, I think there's a, it, I think it's a, Maria, if, there's, if I can say something positive about it, it's a, it's a watershed moment in terms of how we can relate to those, uh, those here versus those there, and, and, and in terms of the government, that is something that can be, that you know, if we raise our voices, that's something that's important to us. I think, uh, I think, uh, I think the government will have to, you know, will, will have to listen. If that's an issue that the Puerto Rican community here, like this is just something me throwing out there, but if that's something that the Puerto Rican community here feels it's it's important to the well-being of Puerto Rico, and I think it is. If we want to get people back, we want people invested in a say in the future of Puerto Rico. That's one way of doing it. Yeah, just one final point. The, the Rosello message to the Boricuas in Florida was, please vote in Florida. Por, por favor, no voten en Puerto Rico. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, you know, my experience in Connecticut actually was that when Maria happened, the intense outpouring of support was unprecedented in our history, right? And so for a very long time, there was very few stateside actions in support of Puerto Rico. And so folks on the island didn't see activism happening. Right? But immediately after the hurricane, it was undeniable that the diaspora was there to help and moving faster than probably the island could handle. And so I felt a huge difference when I was there a year ago, living there as you know, a janky from Connecticut, right? But now it was clear that we showed up when we needed to, right? And so I did see that there was a difference that when I went back afterwards, that folks were much more willing to welcome us. And I also think there's a bit of a difference now in the diaspora as far as who is the diaspora. A lot of those folks that were originally you know, criticizing me for you know, living in the diaspora now are living in Chicago and Texas and Florida, right? And so it's a lot of our families that were unable to move that are staying there. And so the, the diaspora, I think, is getting a little more fluid than I think it was before. But I definitely saw a significant difference in appreciation and, and camaraderie after the hurricane, when because the diaspora, I do think, did uh, rise to the occasion. So there, there, is, there is a definite fear, there is a definite fear in the government of Puerto Rico that the diaspora, many of the members of the diaspora, their voice for independence will overcome what the, go the present government wants for the island. That's the fear. So we have to remember that. Um, going back to your island thing, when, when you started talking about it, my head was about to explode because I, I know that, that you can draw a lot of tangents between the history of Ireland and the history of Puerto Rico, historically. But however, you're still comparing apples and oranges, right? You're still comparing apples and oranges, starting from the fact that, you know, Ireland, can, you can say that that was a, a colony of the UK. Whereas over here we're a colony of the U.S., but you know we still we're still making those are oranges and oranges. oranges. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's, it's different. It's different. But it's, it's the same. Oranges. You can draw tangents, but it's still apples and oranges. We can have we can talk here a whole day about. I've got family that live, cousins that live in Ireland. We've talked about this before. But but 
But again, this is a topic that we, you and I can discuss later on over our wine at the, at the next. So we have Will, we're going to go in the back. Un punto bien rápido. It's beautiful to talk about creando otra palanca. But we need to start using la palanca that we already have. And there's not enough uh, alando palancas on election day here in our country, here in, uh, in the diaspora. So, you know, uh, and I'll hold up the mirror because it's still out we have that problem. So I think that it's important that we try to use uh, this energy today and some of the resources to motivate people to Alan Palanca. And that maybe uh, one role that Puerto Rico can play is people, family members and friends in Puerto Rico calling their family members and friends in the diaspora and saying, Alan Palanca, today's election day. And so I just want to quickly remind folks, you want to stay focused on building a national coalition, right? And that's what this panel is for. We have lots of other spaces, lots of other topics. Go back to doing the lecture, and then I'll come over here. Uh, so there's been a good amount of mention of like diaspora involvement in Puerto Rico politics and advocacy on that behalf. But I'm curious in how, within this like uh, advocacy coalition, is there like an intention to incorporate like social movements grassroots social movements that may exist on the island or within the diaspora um, that may be kind of missing from the institutional framework that we've seen like really highlighted within this conference a lot of times we've been talking about like universities and, and um, nonprofits but I haven't heard a whole lot about the, these more grassroots initiatives and, and what, what, what is what does that look like sure and so I'll just say real quick that like the coalition doesn't exist yet Right, and so we don't can't really answer what they feel about it because it doesn't exist yet. But however, that is something that comes up a lot, right? The interaction between grassroots organizations and grass tops institutions, and how do we square that circle? So, and that's why you need the resources to kind of put that together. You need a cook somewhere, you know, a group of cooks, organizers, coordinators, uh, backbone organizations. Uh, you know, you need a, a campaign, uh, and campaigns cost money. Uh, and so we need to secure those resources somehow, some way, uh, and make sure that it's a nonpartisan effort that uh, unites us more than divides. I think I, I let, me just, let me just add, um, yes. Jesse, um, part of the national Puerto Rican agenda is to address issues. Like you're saying, um, in New York, tomorrow we'll have a table that we're going to start recruiting members to become a chapter member of the New York, the National Puerto Rican Agenda. So anytime that we, as a board member of the National Puerto Rican Agenda, go out in the country and talk about Puerto Rican issues, we're going to open up the doors to create a chapter. Uh, Jolanda Laguerre, she's going to be part of the chapter here in New York. She will have available these forms. So please, anyone from New York, that wants to become a member of the National Puerto Rican Agenda, come by tomorrow and see us because we only have one chapter right now. Connecticut, does that make sense? No, right? You have people here from Philadelphia, from New Jersey, from Florida. So if we need to build coalitions, we need to make sure that we start opening those chapters to address the issues and concerns. Okay, just want to make sure that we need to register and become a member of the National Puerto Rican Agenda. And at least me, when I build coalitions, I don't discriminate based on, on the size of their grassroots, grass middle, grass top size. <laughs> what I want is a coalition of the willing and able, and if you want to put in the work, you're, you're, you're welcome in my group at least. And anyone interested in forming part of the DC, Maryland, Virginia coalition, come to me. I don't have forms, but uh, <laughs> I'll, write your, I'll write your email down. <laughs> There we go. I'll go so I just say really quickly on that one. So I, I actually think that the grassroots approach has to take a different format than a coalition. I don't think coalitions are the best to actually get regular citizens involved in participating at the grassroots level. I think coalitions can muster tremendous amounts of resources in a particular direction from institutions that already exist. But the person that says, I'm just activated yesterday, how do I get involved? Coalition is not the right approach, right? So I actually think a chapter-based model, which is kind of what we're doing in Connecticut, is the way for grassroots folks to get involved. But that wasn't exactly your question. Your question was actually, how do we get some of these 
uh, groups that are left off the mass in, in sort of institutional spectrum and radar into the coalitions, right? So an organization um, like, you know, Casa Pueblo, right, that is a little bit more locally focused to compete with somebody like the Hispanic Federation, right, which has tremendous amounts of resources. And so by the nature of these mass organizations being there, they will crowd out some of the smaller ones, right? And so as we build a coalition, however format that takes, I do think it is vitally important to understand that organizations that just formed recently in the last year are going to have difficulty operating in the same space as La Raza, right? It is difficult to be that person in that room. I've been in as an individual where I don't have 40 years of institutional power behind me and have to tell those folks, this isn't working, right? And so the same thing's gonna happen for those smaller groups. But the reality is when it comes to organizing, when it comes to mobilizing the people, those are the groups that have the closest connection to people. And so that is gonna be a tension we have to resolve moving forward. I heard that question slightly differently. I thought you were saying in Puerto Rico, grassroots organizations in Puerto Rico. Jesse? Good. Yes, I was mostly referring to grassroots organizations in Puerto Rico, but also on the state side. Some of what you said, it touches on it. There's a lack of resources. And also, like, are you drawing political lines? Because yeah, Casa Pueblo is a sexy organization that's grassroots, but what about um, something like, like the mutual aid groups that are some, starting up, are we excluding them? Like, what, where do we draw this line of like people who have become socially mobilized and politically activated into incorporation, into a coalition? Do their voices get minim minim minimalized? What does that look like? Uh, I have a question from a journalist point of view. So, my question is, I mean, that's some frustrations. I hear a lot of I'm a journalist, also Puerto Rican. So <laughs> national coalitions start with shared values. It's exciting that we don't have those written down yet. So we can ask ourselves as a group, what are the shared values that we can all agree on work toward? The Mexican American model is an amazing model to work from. I lived on the West Coast for a really long time. They don't agree on anything except for these five core values. One, they're equal. They deserve an equal seat. If we don't actually demand a seat, we're not going to get invited to the party. This is what Maria has taught us, okay? Two, family. It's a value. You don't have to argue about what that means, except that it's important. Three, economics. Four, access to education. Five, healthcare. These are basic human rights issues that because we have this amazing model, 30 million Mexican-Americans, Chicanos, however you would like to define yourself, it's the 21st century, I don't believe in labels. We, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Well, what are the values that we all as a group decide on? This is how we create a national agenda that will last. Yeah. I have been to every, almost every state in this country. I'm working on a book about how local we are. But I will tell you, the thing that I hear over and over again is that people need to be seen. And in order to be seen, you have to, uh, acknowledge that you are equal and we are in a container that is telling us historically economically politically that we are not equal so we have to decide as a group is that important if it is write it down please have that be one of the points one, one of the five point. things that we decide we've all been in these meetings for years come on we know what to do thank you for all the work that you're doing and you can find me online if you Listen, Wanda, American Money on easy to find. <laughs> but we have to celebrate that we're setting aside the politics for the very practical work that has to be done. So mm -hmm. these children are coming up behind us have a fair shape. That's more important than also their bullshit. Excuse my language. But somebody had to say that. Sure. So any responses from the <laughs> I agree. You know what happens that um, we meet and we gather, and it's always the same mission and purpose because it's all about ser bien puertorriqueño, la cultura, el amor a la patria. So we all do have the same purpose and the mission and the visions and. But you're right when it comes to the core values. I agree with you. Only need five. No, absolutely. But you know what happens? That every organization, when they create and establish their own individual organizations, they have different issues. 
So we will not be able to all agree on the core values. And in Puerto Rican, you know, the Puerto Rican community is basically focusing that we are here in the mainland, the diaspora Puerto Rican, fighting for the things that are happening in Puerto Rico. So we do, on the one umbrella, agree on that. That's why you see all this strong, you know, force behind Puerto Rico. Before Bahia, that's how the national Puerto Rican agenda was created, out of a crisis, economic crisis. And then what happened? Maria happened. So now we're like doubling up. So like I know that I am a member of Comité Noviembre, I'm a vice president, for 30 years. This has been like the number one organization that has been promoting and preserving the Puerto Rican culture. You get it? Quizás saben de Comité Noviembre. And they have a tremendous calendar that we promote and the mission and the purpose is so strong. But you're right, I agree, we need to now go back to the drawing board and focus on the core values. I agree. You know, and I'm happy to like, talk to you all after because I know that there are, there, are, there are people that we all know all over the mainland US who we haven't, even though this is the third year of this conference, uh -huh. we still don't talk to each other. Please. So thank God we're doing it now. Sorry, okay. I just want to reiterate what Maria said it's about process and participation. And she made an invitation. So tomorrow, there's going to be some process started. And so that's the opportunity to uh, start developing this, uh, this core value, you know, this common values and common goals. Thank you. Yeah, and so as someone that's been participating a little bit, it's, it's not the common values that the problem is the how afterwards, right? Exactly. And so we can say, I support education, I support healthcare for everybody. How do we get there and who's going to do the work is the bigger problem. Because it is a tremendous labor intensive project to have a national organization essentially on volunteer hours at this point in time, right? And so I think that is a kind of where we're at. I think there are, the National Puerto Rican Agenda has outlined some values, but it really is the implementation that uh, is- I wanna know what they are, share them. Sure, National Puerto Rican Agenda.org. What are you gonna be in? You're gonna be in the New York Times. Yeah, all right, so let me right here with uh, Grace Coke, yeah. Okay, my name is Jose Vinegas, I'm 73 years old, I'm still going to school an entrepreneur um, it cost according to Nelson market during the last year it cost two hundred fifty dollars to get somebody registered and he tells me a la palanca yo digo pa qué right because we are not going to invent the wheel it has already been invented if you look at the this, uh, the, the Hindu Pakistani community look at Mississippi you have a, an Indian government Mm -hmm. Because they copy Apex yeah. model of organization. All right? And for people, I went to Puerto Rico, I was there for seven years. My own friends who are the leadership of the so called independence body, because they fear me. They thought I was going to take their place. I have no business in politics. Uh, I think if they tell me that now, somebody just proposed. A bank, the People's Bank, the Diaspora Bank. So if we shift our focus from charity to entrepreneurship, all right, and they tell me, oh, you have to know that yeah, I own the bank. <laughs> <laughs> right? Well, let's begin the back of Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Abraham, and right now I'm kind of excited when I come here. Really, the Puerto Rican people coming together and I get like this. So I just want to say, uh, first, uh, Mr. Ortiz, uh, you know, welcome to the staff. And I want to say thank you for the drama, for your knowledge. So we're trying to get to the point. But I came a little bit late because it seems like I want to go to all the classes. Which this is what I'm like, ah. But right now, I'd like to get a clarification. I'd like to know, I feel sometimes, like, what do you basically do and what can I do? And uh, the theme is right now, is just like a different category. Uh, the different categories, we have a lot of professional persons and some people are wow. all different, you know, education. Like I said, I'm impressed. I'm, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. The presence. But how about the other community, or maybe people like me, that right now I'm not working, I'm not doing anything. I want to do something. I want to get involved. Because to me, this is history. What is happening and the question is, what are we going to do? And I'd like to know if, if these are the intentions 
of what you're doing is a wonderful name of it. And it is a, a National Puerto Rican African uh, Advocacy Coalition. That's awesome. So the question is, I'm sorry, sometimes I go on and on and on. Just let me know what's going on. Just say something. <laughs> okay, and I'll sit down. But please, how can I help? What can we do? And once again, um, I'm in place. I'm very happy that I'm here. And I'd like to know, how can I, I want to be involved. Uh, come to tomorrow's meeting. Come to the uh, National Puerto Rican Agenda meeting and, and start getting involved there. I mean, that's uh, an effort that's seeking to build a backbone at a national level. Go, go to the National Puerto Rican Agenda's website, sign up for events, and, uh, and we'll, we'll we'll figure out a way to get to get you connected. Elizabeth, do not underestimate yourself, sweetheart. You do a lot. Sometimes we think we're not doing a lot. Do not underestimate. You do mucho más de la persona que yo conozco que pudieran hacer más. So please give a hand to Elizabeth because I know that. Um, so I'm going to say it real quick again. So I, did, I definitely think that a national coalition is not the best in order to get folks that are not in institutional spaces involved. I do think a chapter based organization is the way to do it. So, for instance, if somebody wanted to join the National Puerto Rican Agenda Virginia chapter, right, like the first thing we would find out is, are there any other folks already in your state that the chapter exists? If it doesn't, we would have you start one, right? And so everybody's first entry is to either to join the state chapter or to start the state chapter. From there, you can have a ladder of engagement to get folks uh, involved going up the chain, but that is going to be impossible without a regional coordinator to help people that want to start a chapter be able to do that. And so I think what the coalition can do, though, is muster those resources and get the expertise into the field so that we can have trained and educated folks able to do that work. Right. And so I do think we don't want to expect a national coalition to be able to solve all the problems. Right. It is one way of organizing and there's many ways of organizing. And so we're going to go over here and then over here and then we're going to wrap up. So first, the channel, media question. Uh, first, a comment. Thanking Edwin Melendez and Hunter College for a wonderful work they do and for inviting us. So first, the channels for Regents in USA, digital and, and TV employed. So the, this is the, the big comment. We believe we were at the inception of the movement, National Puerto Rican Agenda Orlando 2015, understood. And this is a question. I believe that you guys have done a great job. But also, I think you're putting together, perhaps, or if not, I'd like to ask the, the members here, a set of principles of convergence, of meeting of the minds, of things we want in health, education, welfare, and so on, so that our <coughs> chapters in each state can go to state legislators and the candidate of, to Congress and tell them this is what the Puerto Ricans need, this is what we believe in, very similar to what you're saying, and that way we have a set of principles that we can show and lobby and, and have an advocacy uh, position like we did the other day with the uh, candidate for Orange County Mayor uh, Demings when we met and with uh, Congressman Val Demings we would like to do that so that is the question are we doing that is there any way we can help is there a set of principles that we can bring forth before the next midterm elections in November Dr. Melinda, you want to address the crowd with us uh, right now Jason is the leader <laughs> <laughs> not, not yet yeah once Edward gives me the authority to start making changes right, right, right. <laughs> that's here yeah. that's here for sure. I mean, I mean, so if you go to nationalpuertoricanagenda.org, you can see there's quite a bit actually on there. There's, no, a, there's a lot. Right? Oh, yeah. Sure. You want to speak? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was national Puerto Rican agenda, but I will say, though, that, uh, that we need a, a, a national coalition in order to be uh, more effective in, in having a more unified voice. Now, to achieve that, and what people have said, you have to have fewer or uh, consensus building issues than rather a warm agenda that brings more contentious to the table. So I think, you know, uh, you know the, the whole question of policy on a few things. But right now, everywhere we go is it for the diaspora, is Puerto Rico. Don't be confused about that. Whether the solidarity, the emergency, and now, the question is, how do you harness that? How do you challenge that? So what I know of the National Program Agenda, which might not be enough, or not enough, is that uh, the organizations can belong, and as Jason suggests, individuals can belong. 
And the reason what I think that it's a good strategy is because you get to combine the institution and the sort of high level advocacy from a theater and a couple of Acacia and some of the other national organizations. You combine that with the local organizations, such as, you know, the Monica Bota and the Acción Puerto Rican, Yaya in Connecticut, there are a bunch of others. So you have those existing footprint of the Puerto Rican community. You don't have to invent that. Yet, there is a lot of people around the room and everywhere else that would like to join. So the question is how we can also harness individuals that do not belong to those organizations to move forward. And by the way, we have, I think, a whole spectrum of organizations they they actually uh, uh, train people to go do local <coughs> lobby. Boricua Bota mobilized people, not for voter registration, to get issues from the face of the elected official or that wants to be elected official, right? So you have this spectrum of organizations that are all coalescing on the same agenda. And the question, as Jason and Maria and others and Jaime uh, have uh, stated, is how do you how do you bring all this um, power into more unified voice? So the fact that we have a good footprint in our community is not in dispute. And by the way, all these institutionalized organizations, IBM in Boston or APM in Philadelphia, and Union Body Connection or Asociación Puerto Rican de Marcha. They were grassroots organizations, and they institutionalized because they saw that as the only way to sustain the support of the community. Do they become too institutionalized? That's a different question. <laughs> but the point is that, that there is a, a medium point for the grassroots and the institutional. And I think we all, it's a big umbrella, and I think we all think, uh, you know, I myself joined. I pay my uh, dues, and I hope to vote in the next convention. So from what I know, it's a good thing to do. Wow. So what we're going to do is we're, we're just going to take these two questions here at, at the same time, and then if you all want to answer both of them and do final thoughts, and then we'll wrap up, right? So we have this question and then this one. I think mine will be quick. So uh, my name is Lena. I'm from Lancaster City, and I serve on the school district of Lancaster School Board. And one of our challenges is that we're a city that's surrounded by a very conservative county. And that's the same for Allentown and Reading, the 222 quarter that you're talking about. So I'm curious how a coalition, and maybe it, maybe this is referencing some of what you've been, been reiterating, um, how a coalition will help bridge those divides. And then there's also a generational divide. So there's the recent arrivals, and then people like me that are second or third generation that feel like you're reconnecting while also trying to be active. And I'm wondering how how that may be addressed with, the, with this kind of coalition, or if there's another option. Or like, if it's regional, is it like the city is one thing, the counties are another thing? So maybe that's a lot of questions. So, so we're going to well, take the second question and then wrap up. Yeah, yeah. answer both. Of them. Very good. Thing. So a comment on question. The first thing is, uh, we don't have to go to Ireland to find an example of how the diaspora mobilized politically. In 2012, I think it was, uh, the Dominican Republic actually created a, a, those who come out. They have seven representatives in their Congress for Dominicans living abroad. And so that's like a recent example that might be interesting. Uh, also, for uh, Mr. Gonzalez, uh, you mentioned that uh, you hear that a lot of the organizing space in the state of Pennsylvania and elsewhere is, is being monopolized or taken over by partisan efforts. And I was wondering if you could expand it on by that. Well, so we have sort of the, the geographic question, right? Like, how do we handle cities versus you know counties and states? Um, and then also the polarization politically. I mean, we'll start with Will and then go this way. So um, obviously, uh, like we mentioned, the governor of Puerto Rico is supposedly asking people to place the vote, participate, and echoing okay. some of the things that are being said, it's echoing some of the things that some of us are saying. Uh, and that's beautiful. Uh, but however, when it comes from an elected official who's a leader of a party, uh, then it can turn off other people who are opposed to him because of some other things. And so I think that it's important that it be a nonpartisan, very focused on one, two, three things. Uh, there's also danger that uh, even elected officials here uh, do that. So that it be housed in a nonpartisan, uh, I think makes the tent bigger. Uh, so that's what I, that I was saying. And then to answer your question, you know, blessed, uh, we organized a FEMA legal clinic in Lancaster, Reading, 
Uh, again, there are some backbone organizations there. There's growth there. Um, and, um, I, it, it, and, there, and there's a need to glue things together. Um, and um, it, it, there's a huge absence. And, and so uh, we've been approached to see, because we've done the job in Philadelphia of helping nurture coalition. And it's very scary. I mean, I literally was threatened that I needed to do the female legal clinic in Reading and Lancaster. That was going beyond. So I don't have the resources to it. And I'm not saying give me the resources. I'm saying it has to come from the 222 corridor, those resources to come together. So, you know, hoping that as, as the things develop, like that's a Puerto Rican agenda, those things develop too. If I can comment on it, that one of the advantages of having a coalition, and particularly a national coalition, is that so maybe, maybe, I don't know the issues you're facing there, but, uh, but for example, if, 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 you know, an elected official might say, well, I don't want, you know, these are like three people that I, I can just dismiss. But if you say, well, I come from a group that represents, has members in the 50 states, and we can generate this amount of actions, and I don't have the data with me, but last year, during the supplementals, we did a, an email campaign with the National Puerto Rican Agenda, and we generated, Edith, do you know the numbers by any chance, or no? I heard about 10,000 10, emails. And so that's where there's an added value in a coalition is that you have a lot more voices that, that perhaps in a small community uh, you, you, know, you, don't, you don't have. So that's always an added bonus of being part of a coalition. Well, um, <clears throat> I'm going to sound like a broken record again. <laughs> to, me, to me, it's data, 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 and information. Um, I'm, I'm a successful businessman. I've created several businesses, but it's, it's about doing a business plan. It's about the numbers. And if there's an analysis that needs to go on here, like, Dr., like the doctor was saying this morning, if it's in the form of, like you were saying earlier, about looking at other entities that are not reinventing the wheel, that's a part of analysis. Doing a survey, doing what, what, the, what the college is doing on compiling data and being able to get sufficient data in order to be, be able to make concerted and intelligent decisions. And if this national Puerto Rican agenda is that, that galvanizing organization that's able to put that forward, then I'm all for it. I'll sign up tomorrow. <laughs> all right. So I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> three, are you three? <laughs> all right. So I'll just say really quickly that I, that I do think that having chapter-based organization helps you, right? Because that's the person that can come in and say, this is how you get started. Right? And whether there's two people or 200 people, you at least have a framework that you can have somebody come in and help, right? And deal with some of those spaces. So some are very conservative, right? And some are a little bit easier. Organizing in Connecticut is very different than organizing in New York City, right? But as long as we have each other's backs and can show up to each other's events, it makes you, when you have that event, uh, it's not just you, right? And so I do think that's why, whether we do chapters or a coalition, whatever it may be, it's not either or. Right? It is yes and. We have five million people to draw on, and we can do all the different things that we want to do. However, it's only if y'all get off of the participant and, and the, uh, off of the spectator side of things right, and join. Because the questions of, is the National Coalition going to do X? Right? That will be determined by whoever gets involved. Right? Those, those decisions have not been made yet. And so if an entire specific demographic of people are the ones that comprise the organization, they're going to make decisions in that direction. Right? And so the only way it's going to be diverse and multi-sector and multi-party is if all of those different folks get involved, right? Because there's definitely a lot of work to do, a lot of training that we need to train each other on how to do it, and a lot of space to move. And we don't have a lot of extra time, right? What we do have is a lot of Puerto Ricans in the United States and a lot of political power, right? And right now, we're just not aligning it properly. And so I think that's where folks that have things that they would like to see the national organization do or things that we must do, the only way the national organization is going to get that information is if you join in and tell us that's what we should be doing, right? Just like democracy in general, we get the government that we, you know, work for, right? And so I think that's going to be important for everybody else. You know, if you have organizations that want to join the coalition, that want to be a part of it, if you're somebody that's an individual that wants to get started, feel free to reach out to me. The national website is PuertoRicanAgenda.org or right? com. Or, or, right? Or you can it and at NPRA for the national, the Connecticut uh, website is Connecticut Puerto Rican Agenda org. And so you can look to Connecticut. We do have a model that folks can copy. It's not that complicated. Um, and then, of course, you know, we are hoping to, we'll discuss this tomorrow, uh, have our national assembly this year or in the near future, right? And so that will be the event 
that determines what the national Puerto Rican agenda will be moving forward. So we invite all of you to participate in that and join us for that. And I also, uh, if we have one last round of applause for our panel.